Hey everybody, how are you today? This is Jim Prusak from The Pain PT, and I have with me today a special guest, Georgie Oldfield, who many of you may not know, but Georgie is a physiotherapist in the UK, in England, and she started an organization called SERPA, the Stress Illness Recovery Practitioners Association. And I've been fortunate enough to train with Georgie and go over to the UK a few times and work with her. And many of you may not know her work because she's across the pond, so to speak, but I really want to bring her on because she has such a great perspective on this work we're doing around TMS or MBS, PPD. And I think she can share her story a little bit and, you know, some nuggets of healing. So, Georgie, thank you so much for coming on today. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, Georgie, maybe we can just start in the beginning and sort of start with your story of how you got into this work because you're a physiotherapist like me mm -hmm. from that medical world. So maybe just give the viewers a, sort of a backdrop of how you got into this work in the first place. Um, yes, well, it was really from trying to answer all the questions that I was uh, facing, mainly about patients. I think I was actually questioning patients more than my own experience at that point. Um, but so I was seeing a number, I'd left the National Health Service, set up my own uh, clinic because I was interested in helping people with pain and had already started using some uh, different approaches like um, Bowen therapy and uh, acupuncture, for example. Um, but I started to question why so many people were coming in uh, with either acute or even chronic pain who'd actually just woken up one morning with pain. Uh, and I'd certainly done that, uh, woken up with severe sciatica, had no clue as to what, why. And of course, we blame the mattress or the pillow, uh, even though we slept with it for months or years. Um, and why people would come in having injured their back, doing something that they would normally do with no problem. And maybe they're fit, healthy people, and yet they bent over to pick up a pen even, and their back had gone. And then they they come, came to me months or years later with, in a, an even worse state. And it just wasn't really making sense of this physical problem. Um, and so I gradually started sort of questioning and questioning. Uh, and then started, for example, other things coming in were people who had been diagnosed with prolapsed disc or stenosis or disc degeneration. And some of those would avoid the surgery that had been recommended. Um, and that didn't make sense because the gentle treatments I was doing, uh, as you know, would not actually remove the yeah. disc pressing on the nerve, for example, or that stenosis, especially where it's the bone narrowing onto um, a nerve. So all this was perplexing me. Um, and I just read widely, I was talking to colleagues, not just physios, but other health professionals, and just trying to find an answer. Um, and I think actually the first clue for me came when I woke up with severe sciatica. And this was soon after leaving the National Health Service and setting up my own business. Now, my husband's self-employed as well, and it was a stressful time because I suddenly had to make this business work and be able to pay our bills. Um, and this was back, um, oh, back in about 2003 or 2005, I actually set my clinic up and went full time. Um, and uh, so I was outwardly, not many people would realise I was stressed, but inwardly, yes, I was. Uh, and I woke up with sciatica, couldn't put my shoes and socks on for a couple of weeks and uh, eventually went to see a craniosacral therapist actually. And she was the first person who'd said to me, so what's going on in your life? And mm. that then started this, oh, okay, well, life. And I just started talking to her and then started realizing, you know, how I was feeling and all the stress being expressed. Within a couple of sessions, two or three sessions, the sciatica had gone. And I was going back to her every few months with a different problem, maybe shoulder pain or something. And each time, well, what's going on in your life? And I began to think, well, if you're telling me this is all about stress, then surely I can do something about it. Why do I keep having to pay and see you yeah. if we can get to the bottom of it? Um, and so eventually I came across the work of uh, Dr. Sarno and read his book, the first one. I think it was Healing Back Pain I read first. And it was for me like an epiphany. And actually, I was re while I was reading his book, I, had, uh, I woke up one morning with severe neck pain. And I knew exactly what was causing it but I hadn't reached the point of the book which told me what to do about it and for a few days I was with people and I couldn't do much about it but when the stressful uh, thing that was going on uh, dissipated the pain settled right down so that was really uh, confirming for me 
Dr. what Dr. Sana was saying in the book. And, I, and as we all do as practitioners, when we read the books, we, or many of us will think of patients that we uh, recognize and start thinking, oh yeah, that was going on. And I began to think back to a load of my patients. I began to order loads of Dr. Sano's books, literally a box of 50 books from America. I would sell them <laughs> five pounds each. Um, I ran a, uh, a, web, uh, a webinar to put on a video of his, D, a DV, his DVD. And we had about two dozen people, patients uh, with chronic pain. Um, who either had recurring pain or persistent pain and had had it for quite some time. And they watched the, the DVD and we discussed it at the end and I supported a few of them and they did brilliantly, didn't need any more treatment from me. So that really confirmed it for me. I began, you know, help, talking to more and more patients and realized that actually this is much bigger than I had realized initially. And so I um, ended up contacting Dr. Sano visited him in 2007, spent a few days with him um, and uh, observed his work, observed his lectures and um, followed him around with patients and then came back and set up my own programme with his support. And, uh, and then I did a retrospective pilot study actually um, and I looked at the first three months of patients that I'd supported through the, um, the programme that Dr. Sana would do initially um yeah. and uh looked back and it was something like the i think we had about two dozen people on the study um of those the average amount of time they'd been in pain was five years none of them i did any hands-on physiotherapy with and we had something like an 82.3 percent i think it was um recovery rate in that over 80 percent recovered by um, over 82.3 percent recovered by over 80 percent and some of them completely um so that helped me start really reinforcing that this is what I need to do and you know me Jim I'm not one to just sort of gently do it I just said sort of, right this is what I want to do and it wasn't an easy ride but um, I gradually did more and more in that um, of this side and gradually dropped the physical side and beginning to really expand on it as well over the years. And, and so you how long you've been doing this now for are we just doing solely this type of work because you transitioned like you said now, how long have you been practicing this type of work for? So I saw Dr. Sana at the end of 2007, um, and really through 2008, I transitioned. Um, occasionally, for a year or so after that, I would see some people who came to me locally, um, assess them, and if, they, if I could tell they weren't quite there, I would treat them. Um, because during that time while I'm treating them, I could talk to them and uh, sow seeds and quite often by the end of that they were much more ready to take this on board and if not I began referring on to other physios a particular physio who's a musculoskeletal physio near me um, yeah. but because there was I mean the reason I went to see Dr. Sana was because there were no psychotherapists no uh, physical therapists or doctors or anyone in the UK or Europe that I could find who knew about this work hence I needed to go to America and after a while, I began thinking, well, it's all very well having, you know, peer support, uh, no peer support here, actually no peer support for me over here. So that's when I started developing SERPA. But leading up to that point, I attended the first conferences that were being set up in America. So Howard Schubiner, um set up the first one in 2009. Um, in Ann Arbor and then the next one is in California and the next one New York. So I attended all those um, to uh, shadow. So I stayed with uh, Howard Schubiner and his wife and I shadowed him. So he's been a fantastic mentor throughout all this time as has um, Dave Clark. And so it just gave me the chance to really integrate with them, learn from them, go to the conferences uh, and then um, come back here and then be on my own again. So, that, so that's when I began thinking this, I need some more peer support over here. Plus I wanted more people I could refer on to if necessary, for example, psychotherapists who yeah. understood this work. Um, and that's when I decided to set up SERPA back in 2010. Yeah, great. I know you've done such a fantastic job at that SERPA program and Really, you're kind of running two arms, aren't you? You're educating health professionals, right? We can talk about that as well, as mm -hmm. well as just feeding patients, right? So you're doing two different things to try to get awareness out and to spread the message, so to speak. So maybe we'll talk a little bit about the healthcare side, professionals, for people who are listening, 
and your mm -hmm. organization Serpa and what you've done with that because I know I've learned a ton from you and come over a couple times and taken the training and it's fantastic. So maybe share a little bit to the viewers here about that part of your Serpa mm -hmm. organization and what you're doing for healthcare uh, practitioners out there. Well, it was really set up because there was no training um, and I just felt there were a few, few reasons, but that was one of the main reasons. And I thought if I develop some training, then it means that others don't have to go through the time and expense that it took me to visiting America three times um, and all that I went through to try and really get to the point where I was able to build on what Dr. Sarna had, had taught me. Because that in itself, when I came back from America, there were no psychotherapists to refer people to. So it was a steeper learning curve, but great, because there, there is a lot of work out there um, that supports this as well, that it sort of dovetails beautifully with it. So it helped me realize that if I can't refer on for psychotherapy, it made me start thinking, why are you struggling? What's going on? Which then helped me learn more. And so I wanted to pass this on to other health professionals. Um, and that's why in I remember being over in LA for the 2010 conference and saying to Dave Clark and um, Howard Schubiner uh, that th this is what I was thinking of doing, that I wanted to set something up, but encourage it. They were already thinking about the PPD, but harder for them because they're, they're all spread all over America. Whereas I had a couple of people helping me to set up and I was ready to go. So Dave Clark came on board as our international clinical advisor. Um, and, uh, and I just developed the training initially as a physical training. So I would go around the UK. We've also run a course in Spain. Um, and people would come from all over, as you did, um, to be able to learn how to start integrating this work, um, this approach into their own work. So initially it was, we had an introductory day and then we had a um, was it four day practitioner training. Um, yeah. And, uh, and then we would support people, as much, or I would support people as much as possible after that. But, but that was difficult because I was busy trying to do everything else and didn't really have the time um, to provide the ongoing support that many practitioners were asking for. Um, we also decided to open the training up to health professionals, mental and physical health professionals, including um, complementary therapists and, um, and coaches, because often they are the first on the scene and they might be able to prevent people from going on to having really chronic persistent problems. And so that's why I felt we should be opening it up. Um, so we do train um, all health professionals, including doctors. Um, I think we've got about 120, no, more than that now because we've gone online. But before we went online, we had about 120 practitioners who'd gone through the training. Um, so, but it took a lot of effort to yes. go around the country to market it all. I have, I had then only five hours of admin support and I have 10 hours from Zoe, as you know, who's absolutely fabulous and is one of our practitioners as well. She's a, a hypnotherapist. Um, and so she's provided a huge amount of support over the last three years. Um, and she was there when we decided to move the training online. And there were various reasons for that as well. Some people saying that, you know, they couldn't get to us. Are we ever going to put this training online? And also on a personal side of it, we have three elderly parents. Um, and I just felt if anything happens, what happens if I can't train, um, run a training? We'd started training other, some of the more experienced practitioners, uh, it, thinking that we could um, teach them to run the training, but it never really got to the point where any of them were able to complete the training for various uh, reasons of their own. So in the end, we felt we would move the training online. Um, and thankfully, Zoe had a lot of experience with online programs um, from the corporate work she used to do before she was a hypnotherapist. So together, we uh, moved all the, all the training, developed into it into an online training. Um, and that then freed me up to be able to then support people and provide the, them with the support and guidance that they wanted. And we, as you know, we built this membership so that we now have a membership scheme where we can provide a lot of support and guidance and a load of resources for people to help them start integrating this work um, into, their, into their own work that they're doing, however they decide to do that, and we support that as well. Yeah, fantastic. And I know it's been great having that support and all the things that you offer to practitioners, and I've gained a lot from it myself. So what do you think now with this landscape 
because you've been doing this for a while now with the healthcare, if we're talking about healthcare practitioners, what's the feedback been from people taking the course and what's your take on sort of the general medical community and their openness and acceptance of this type of work? I think there's quite a difference now in that it was a struggle when I started and there was a lot more resistance to it. Um, whereas now actually it's, uh, there's more awareness. I think the mindfulness, um, everything coming up about mindfulness has really helped and people are much more accepting of mind body the pain science has helped as well in that it's really showing um, how emotions and stress impact pain and how we must look at the biopsychosocial side of things so the evidence there is catching up and there is much more awareness so and the people doing the and we have a variety of health professionals and coaches doing the training but the feedback is really really good um, and uh, they have an opportunity then of doing case studies and being having clinical supervision as well, um, which then helps because it's quite challenging to suddenly, it's challenging for the mental health professionals uh, coming into this and suddenly having to start considering physical treatments, uh, physical conditions, for example. And it's also challenging for the likes of you and I who have been focusing primarily for the majority of our career on treating people's symptoms, but treating the body and not actually really considering what's going on in their lives or and even finding out how do you even are, start um, by, you know, finding out what's, you know, beginning to consider adverse childhood experiences, for example. And that takes time to transition and to gain confidence and to learn to really listen and observe the patient. Yes. Yeah. And that, maybe that is a good segue into the next part is like, these adverse childhood experiences and what you're looking for when you are interviewing, let's say, a client or a patient versus a traditional, say, physiotherapy exam, to maybe give the listeners a sort of a snapshot of what you're looking for and what, what are some of the things that stand out to you um, that indicate somebody has TMS or PPD versus just a structural problem. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm in a lucky position anyway now in that um, the majority of my work, uh, patients who come to me, I do two clinical days a week, um, they've already had a number of tests, um, they already know about this work, so it's much easier for me to actually then um, explain things to them. Um, but on the whole, and in, in England they don't do as many tests either, like the MRI scans and ultrasounds and things like that. So what we'll, there are a number of things that we look for. Um, First of all, if they've had an injury and it's become persistent, so after sort of about three months, that our body has an innate ability to heal. So if the pain is persistent, then actually the, the body will have healed. So it's really it's about considering that. Why is it con continuing? We know that persistent pain, that pain becomes persistent. When pain becomes persistent, actually factors that aren't related is, is how severe the injury is. So it's important to notice, to ask about what was going on at the time of the injury, for example, and how did they, even if they had a car accident, how were they at that time? Because loss of hope for the future um, is one of the factors can lead on to um, uh, people having pain becoming persistent. Negative pain beliefs, whether they were anxious, depressed, as well as past trauma. And obviously it's, it's, you're not going to just, if somebody's coming to you just as a physiotherapy patient, the last thing I'm going to say is, did he have adverse childhood experiences, for example? Yeah. Um, so it's the way you bring that in. And it might be, you know, did, did you have any challenges when you were younger, when you were a child? Or were there, was there any time when you felt unsupported? OK, but generally, if somebody comes to me, let's say locally, who doesn't know about this work, I would get, do a physical examination. And as a physiotherapist in the UK, we have autonomy in that we are able to diagnose um, certain conditions. So, and we have what we call red flags. So we're looking for the red flags that would make us think, oh, no, that's a bit risky. Um, you know, they need to have further tests. OK. And often by the time people have come to me anyway, they have seen numerous physios and doctors and specialists and, and nobody's been concerned that there's anything going on, even as sort of serious like tissue damaging disorders. So we have to rule out any tissue damaging, damaging disorders like a fracture and um, autoimmune conditions, for example. OK. Um, and um, but when we've done that, it's about seeing how things fit as well, because quite often the, the symptoms don't fit the diagnosis they've been given. 
and they might be told they have a, um, a prolapsed disc or slip disc of let's say the um, L5 and yet they've got pain at the top of their thigh or their knee which actually is not where the L5 nerve would be feeding. So it's about looking to see whether the symptoms match, are the symptoms moving around, have they had adverse childhood experiences, was, was there stress at the time of the injury, do they have that what we call comorbidity, um, me a mental health condition at the same time, and then looking at their personality. And even um, when, when you start looking at talking to somebody, a patient in the clinic, it's quite interesting to observe how they behave. Um, for example, apologizing profusely when they're about 10 seconds late or, um, sure. you know, apologizing lots during a, uh, you know, you can tell they're quite the people pleaser um, or very analytical with the way they're talking. So again, it's then about looking at their personality, their beliefs, their behaviors. Um, so yes. does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> You know, basically what you're saying, and we know this, is there's a lot of different factors, like you mentioned a bunch, adverse child experiences, personality traits, yeah. the person is, there's ongoing stress in their lives currently. So there's a lot of different pieces, aren't there? It's not only just one piece. Absolutely. It could and I be, think quite they often have adverse childhood experiences, but they have a lot of stress or their personality is, is such that it predispositions them to having some chronic pain, right? So there's different factors to really hone in on. Absolutely. And it, and everybody's different. And it's sort of recognizing that. And I think quite often what people do miss is they, they journal about past trauma or even current stress, but they're less aware of just how much self-induced stress they're creating themselves on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and that is something that certainly on the program I run with my patients, we focus on that a lot because that's so often missed. And because it's, it's, it's our, it's our, uh, it's the habitual behaviors for us, isn't it? That's right. The way we behave, the way we, oh, I mustn't be late or, or you know, people pleasing or ruminating, overanalyzing. And we, when we are trying to do this work ourselves, it can be quite hard to recognize what's going on. Um, or people really try so hard to find what is it there in that, as Dr. Sana puts, the reservoir of rage. What is it in there that's yes. and must be still there that's causing all this pain? And quite often it's not necessarily something that's hidden away, especially if they've done a lot of journaling and worked on the unconscious and some emotional awareness and meditations, etc. And sometimes it, it's often things happening day to day that's triggering um, stuff that then fuels the symptoms. Yeah, I agree with you. Those internal stressors, our own mind, mm. create such a stress on us. We don't always see it because we're not aware of ourselves, right? So we always think of the external stressors, or we think we think trying to think of rage or whatever events happened in the past, but we just can't see that how we're operating day in and day out is creating stress in ourselves, right? Absolutely, and especially in the world that we live in, Jim. <laughs> yeah, crazy just world. This ongoing, always on the go, and. It's often important to listen, as you know, to our patients and what they're saying. You know, uh, well, I have to power through this and, uh, and you know, just really pushing through things and I want to get rid of my pain and I'm trying so hard and just think, whoa, actually, this is more about being more allowing, letting go, having periods of silence, as we've talked about before, um, to allow ourselves to just become more in balance and to calm the fight or flight system down to boost the relaxation response. Um, and more often than not, people aren't doing that. They just feel they like need to be on the go all the time. And it's almost like a badge of honor to be busy, busy, busy. And I have to admit that was me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> Absolutely. But we're yeah. still on the journey. We're getting there. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a never ending journey, isn't it? And it's just a deepening Absolutely. process, which is you had to hit a certain point in the journey and you actually start to enjoy it, which I do now versus there's a lot of, I notice in a lot of people when they start the journey, there's a lot of resistance up front naturally, right? To try to change and they just don't see it in themselves or they just see things in a negative viewpoint versus saying, hey, this is actually something I can learn from in yes. a positive way, or at least a neutral way. Yes. And I say to people, this is not a journey to, this is not a, a program or approach to get rid of pain. This is actually a self-development program. It's about personal development and about learning ourselves. How one of my Spanish practice, a Spanish patient said to me, thank you for teaching me to live life with less resistance. Yes. Because it's less reactive and not analyzing so much and less judgmental, then we make life easier for ourselves. It doesn't mean we just 
ignore things. It's just the way we react with that we're aware of what's happening and then we can learn to respond rather than just this rage or uh, judging or whatever and beginning to understand it from someone else's point of view or um, learning to have boundaries, learning to say no. All these things make our life so much easier. Absolutely. And so what, so you kind of touch upon a lot of different factors you use in the, in this approach for healing. Maybe just go over again, what are the common things that you offer to people for support and that you find valuable for people that you've worked with that do recover? What are some of the common themes or things that people do that help themselves recover? Well, definitely using journaling, therapeutic journaling, and really using that um, in various different ways. Some of them, the uh, therapeutic and emotional journaling, like unsent letters, um, dialoguing. So the, I think what often happens is that many people who come to me say they've journaled, but it doesn't work. So I always ask them how they journal, okay? Because quite often what they're doing is they are journaling about all the stuff that's wrong or what happened in the past or how they're feeling generally today and what's wrong. But they And then they leave it and then the next day, they're feeling just as bad, so they journal about it again. So they're just kept in this victim mentality, basically, um, of uh, reacting to what's happening in their lives. But they never get to that point of actually being able to look at it from the other side, maybe somebody else's point of view, putting it into perspective, rationalizing it, so they can let go, move on, and, uh, and even forgive. And that is about really understanding that this is forgiveness is not about uh, the other person. It's not forgiving, condoning what they've done, but it's about uh, recognizing that forgiveness is about is for us. Yeah. Um, that can take time for people to understand that, can't it? Yeah, that's a great point because I think you're exactly right. People tend to be stuck in that rut of it's always going to be negative, negative, and yeah. more negative again, more negative. And it's like actually just changing of the perspective. Once you touch upon the emotions, right, like what you said, then to move through them and past them is forgiveness, acceptance, right, allowance, and to yeah. come to a place of peace around it, not that you continue to badger away at it day after day. Yeah. Right? And look, you've learned from it because, you know, there are many, for example, psychotherapists who become psychotherapists because of abuse in their childhood, as just one example. Um, and it's about looking at, okay, it's happened. Now we'll, let's move on from this. What can I learn from this? How can I improve the situation now? So journaling could be all sorts, and it's about being uncensored, behaving like that little child who's having a rant and rage, and then putting it into perspective and being able to look at it from somebody else's point of view. Um, we use stream of consciousness journaling to clear the head of all this rubbish that's going on, and that, that at the end of the day, can help a lot with sleep. We use journaling as a way of rationalizing our thoughts. So rather than focusing on all the negative, just jotting down some of those things that the fears or things that are going through our minds and then focusing on rationalizing, but in a really compassionate, non-judgmental way, as if you're talking to a child um, and reassuring them and using their name, your name and just saying, you know, I understand, no wonder you were feeling like that, but actually, you know, let's look at it and what can we learn from it, et cetera. So we do use journaling. That's the first thing that I would be encouraging people to do because it's free, it's simple. Right. Maybe not always easy, but it is simple, okay? Um, very much teach emotional awareness. So the I would suggest with virtually everybody I see, there's a real, um, what's the word? Um, uh, lack, of, a, a lack of feeling, lack of uh, awareness of how they're feeling. And even when we start doing emotional awareness work, very much it's in the head, thinking, overthinking, and, and you know, I get people sort of asking how am I feeling, and then they're looking for an answer. I always yeah. say the difference is if you think of the observing and, and looking, that if you imagine looking at a fish tank and you've been told there's a stripy fish in there, looking is sort of looking, okay, where's that fish? Oh, there it is, there it is, and where's it? Oh, there it's gone. And observing is just relaxed back and yeah. just, oh, there it is. There it is, and noting it, naming it, whether it's a sensation or an emotion, and beginning to really feel what's going on in their body in related to emotion. And when they start doing that, often they will feel that uh, a symptom will increase. The symptom will increase uh, because the emotion is beginning to come, and it's about self-soothing and recognizing that okay, but it's fine. Let the emotion be there because, as we know, the symptoms are there because it's stopping us from, from feeling what are perceived to be very dangerous emotions. 
Yeah, that's right. And it's funny because I see that too in people intellectually. They say, oh, yeah, I tell myself it's okay. It's not dangerous. Yet then they don't want to feel it. So when it yes. gets to the real part of experiencing what they're feeling, they go, oh, no, I can't stay with that feeling. So it's actually, you got, like you said, you've got to go deeper than just intellectual mind with this sort of experiential work, right? And how how many times do we hear people saying, um, uh, yeah, well, I understand this. I fully understand it. You know, I've read this and I've read that and I've, you know, been journaling and I know it, but they're not feeling it. Yes. Yes. And I think that's like, you know, when I was looking up some of the research about this alexithymia, which is this inability to feel your feelings and that more than 50% of people with chronic pain have this condition, then it makes a lot of sense why they have difficulty getting in touch with what they feel. Yeah. Right. So that's why there's, there is a learning curve there. And I think some people that just give up on it too soon, kind of like with journaling, oh, yeah. it doesn't work, you know, where it actually takes practice to learn the ability to sit and feel, doesn't it? It, it takes a lot of practice. It really does. I, I wrote a couple of blogs on, that I've put on the Serpa website called Befriending Yourself. And um, it's how and why it, we should use emotional awareness. And uh, the, we've, I put two videos of clients that I worked with to show them how, how, to, um, how to do emotional awareness. The first one, Joan, is a lady whom I was uh, doing Skype, not Skype, but Zoom calls with her. And this was two thirds of the way through the three month program I do. And she was still very much in her head, as is very common, and really struggling to feel. And I suggested that I record the session with her and send it to her so she could listen to what I was saying and sort of follow it again. And it just happened that in that video, she actually was able to just sink down and feel how she was feeling. Um, and what was interesting, she had a diagnosis of fibromyalgia and was already well on her way to recovery. But for a couple of days, she'd had um, a shoulder pain come on and knee pain quite badly. And she was trying so hard to work out what was going on and in her head trying to think think it through and consciously she just couldn't do that and yet when we did this and then she was finally able to sort of sink down and feel notice um, what was going on in her body rather than in her head she it, she just had an insight and that sort of release of emotion and the pain just settled down now i yeah. put another video in because i don't want people to think that happens all the time yeah. right right <laughs> But luckily, right. she was happy with us to use the video. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Because I think that can brings up the next notion that people think they hear the stories that they read Dr. Sarno's books or your book. Um, and, I, and if, by the way, just give the name of your book out there so people know you have a book out there that people can buy on Amazon. Can you buy it in the U.S., by the way? You can. It's I on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, on yeah. Amazon. Yeah. It's uh, Chronic Pain, Your Key to Recovery. Yeah. So your book and other people's book, like Dr. Schubiner's book. Uh, Dr. Hanscom's books, but people get this false notion that, hey, you know, I should read this book and I should automatically feel better because other people say that, right? But that's not always the case, is it? No, not at all. And I, and I say that to everybody I talk to. I, I offer free calls for people to just help advise and sometimes just advise a book or just one little snippet. Um, and uh, it's, you know, helping them recognize that I know that in some of the books, it does really push the fact that, well, some people recover just like that. And it's like, well, I haven't, so there must be something wrong with me. Or maybe there is something deep in that reservoir of rage. And often it's not. And then it's about helping them recognize some people recover by reading the books. Some people recover by going on the TMS Wiki, doing the, do the online programs. And other people need support and guidance. And, this, and that doesn't mean they can't recover. They just would benefit from it coaching really from somebody from the outside looking in and seeing what's happening and helping advise them um, and then some of those just a handful of people I work with occasionally will then I will refer on to a, a psychotherapist who's yeah. understanding of this work but because I couldn't do that initially that's what helped the SERPA program uh, evolve because we needed more things to help rather than just journaling Yes, um, and yes. so that was that helped me start looking and, and so searching for other things that could help. So we use mindfulness, for example, um, meditation, some cognitive behavioral uh, therapy, because some of that can be very helpful. Um, and uh, visualization, image, imagery. In fact, sometimes if you say visualization, people seem to think they have to see it. But there's a lot of evidence to support the um, visualization or imagery where you imagine things happening because that helps to 
uh, change the neural pathways in the brain. So this bra the, the pain becomes conditioned, as we know, and um, and therefore we work on the conditioning to break that conditioning. But we can also change the neural pathways um, using various things like the way we speak to ourselves, self-compassion, um, self-soothing, uh, visualization, etc. Um, but it's a bit different pronged approach. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I mean, it's a great thing to talk about because in Dr. Sarno's books, people go there first. He talked about this repressed emotions, right? And so people are hammering away sometimes at that, yeah. not getting results. Yet, like you just mentioned, there's many facets to it because we're talking about the brain and nervous system, right? So we're also okay. talking about thoughts. Right? Yep. So not just emotions, they're all tied in together. But for people that are getting kind of stuck, you know, a lot of people get stuck and then they say, well, I don't, I'm doing all this stuff. What would you say to these people that are hitting a dead end, yet they're journaling and they're doing meditation? Do you have any tips for people um, that are struggling? Generally, what's happening is that they are doing a lot of that consciously um, and, um, and not being as self-compassionate. So I would de definitely encourage the self-compassion. Yeah. <coughs> excuse me. Many of those, for example, aren't aware of how much pressure they're putting themse on themselves day to day with their beliefs, behaviors, um, personality traits, for example. Um, so I would definitely be encouraging emotional awareness, self-soothing. And the way quite often people are pushing themselves, like you said before, you know, creating resistance by pushing themselves forward and, and right, I'm go away pain, I'm just going to push through this. Yes. And yes, sometimes it works. But unfortunately, if that's all they're doing, sometimes that pain can come back. And then if it doesn't, if they can't resolve it that time, they go down that physical route. Because I often think, explain to people that if you had a childhood where you were ignored or abused or just didn't get the attention you needed, and then with this busy world that we live in, we're not really taking note of how we're feeling. So again, we're pushing through things. And if you think of the symptoms as being the inner child, our vulnerable part of us going, can't cope with this, can't cope with this. What are we doing if we're just saying, oh, go away, pain, I can do this, I can push through this. So, and I can see, and I do this, I think it's two parts of it, because a child needs unconditional love and a child needs boundaries. And yep. therefore, yes, that can work, but if you are just pushing, pushing through the pain and telling yourself, yes, I can run, I don't have any pain, that's great because mindset is so important. But if you're doing that without acknowledging the emotion, yes. then that can actually make things worse or things will build up later on. Yeah, I see that too, where people want to just do that piece of push through. I can, I'll go back and do it all my exercises again. I'm just going to go right through this and I'm going to ignore the pain. Yeah. But that doesn't work, does it? Because you're not really addressing the underlying pain or the emotions behind it. You're avoiding them still. You are, but interestingly, people can still recover, can't they? But don't they, by doing that. They can. Some but, people can. Yeah. I think the will, but, the will alone can override certain things right absolutely um, but i do see people months or years down the line where the pain has recurred and that's when they recognize that they aren't being self-compassionate they're not tuning in and feeling these emotions and that's important i often give an example at, of mine actually from oh years ago 10 11 years ago um when i was going through a very challenging time and um, I jumped over a stile. We were going walking over a mountain, jumped over a stile, and I went over on my ankle. And it was really painful, and I could not put my foot down. I had my daughter in my ear saying, just imagine the oxygen flowing to the area. You'll be fine. <laughs> because <laughs> she, the, the, I shared all this work with them, obviously. Um, and I tried that, uh, and unfortunately, it didn't work at that time. Um, and uh, and I tried to just walk and just say, no, come on, I'm fine. It didn't work. OK, yeah. so this is what frustrates me when people say this, you know, well, I got better by doing this, this, that, therefore this works, because sometimes it doesn't. And that's when it's worth trying something else. The fact was my inner child was freaking out about all this stuff that was going on. Um, yes. And I had been thinking about it. And as I jumped over the stile, I went over on my ankle. Now, at that point in time, I didn't know if I'd injured it or not, okay? Sure. Clearly, the the fact that I'd gone over on my ankle, that was almost a TMS response, wasn't it? Because we know where our body is in space. You know, we why would my ankle go over? I jumped over other styles without any problem. 
but on this occasion it went over. I didn't take my boot off in case it was damaged and I couldn't get it back on. I was on a, not a huge mountain, but a mountain, no reception on the phone, okay? So we'd have been stuck if I was stuck there. So I ended up asking my daughter to be quiet for a moment because she was giving advice about this oxygen and <laughs> visualization. Yeah. And what I did was I sat down and I imagined my inner child in front of me. And I allowed myself to feel how I was feeling so I didn't ignore how I was feeling. But then I said to her, do you know what? This is not a great time, okay? Um, and that there's no, there's no reception here and I'm not being helicoptered off this mountain. So come on, let's, <laughs> you know, this is really not a good time. And I promise when we get home tonight, we'll have a hot bath, we'll meditate and we'll really work through this. But for now, we need to just get on. So that was yeah. the listening to the emotions, be, be listening to my inner, inner child, how I was feeling, um, setting some boundaries and yeah. then moving on. And what I did was I imagined her uh, putting her on my shoulders as I got up to walk. And I just said, let's just see how we go. And, you know, if it's really bad, then fine. But let's just see how we go. And I, it was hard at first, but after 10 minutes, the pain had gone and I had no problem after that. So I know that's not chronic pain, but it just does show yeah how we have to feel these emotions and it and just by telling the pain to go just was not going to work for me yes yeah if you bring i mean it brings up great points of that you know compassion self-compassion acceptance calming your system down yes. right setting sort of a boundary in your brain because that actually is a real everything you said is a real chemical electrical signal from your brain back to your body right Absolutely. so you're your 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 ankle is signaling pain in your brain and you're saying no actually i'm okay calm down let's deal with this yep. later and that's a real message back to your body that has a real effect because it diminishes yeah. pain for you and so there's that's there's science said. behind this yeah there is yeah and that's why i say to people even if they suddenly get pain when they're bending or they're on a run or they suddenly get pain they might have persistent pain anyway but if it increases or or suddenly comes on it's natural initially to react and go, oh, no, what's going on, and be frightened. But then it can still work to then, okay, how am I feeling? What's going on? It's okay. This is just about fear. My back is fit and healthy. Use Dr. Sano's reaffirmation statements um, and just reassuring yourself. I get people to keep an evidence sheet so that they write down times when they've had pain when they uh, it, they really there was no need for them, reason physically for them to have pain, or times when they didn't have pain when they were expecting it. And some of the studies, evidence behind it all. So that when they have times like that, if necessary, they can read through those reaffirmation things or remind them what's, what's on that evidence sheet to help self-soothe, to just calm things down. And generally that will allow things, to, because what do we normally do when we have, we're in pain? We just do, we just tighten yeah. up. Um, and that's the worst thing that we can do. But we, yes. if we, even if we react, then we then start responding, self-soothing. And the next time it's a little bit easier and the next time easier until gradually we, we change those neural pathways until we might not have that tr triggering at all. Yeah, and that's it. I mean, it, it speaks to really changing those neural pathways. And like you said, if somebody's been through some adverse childhood experiences or have a lot of stressful events or things like that, their brains are already primed up to go right into that fight or flight response immediately and very strongly right so it takes some practice to kind of go down a different pathway to learn something new in the face of what they think is threatening or dangerous right absolutely absolutely yeah and sometimes it can take some little trigger in the current moment to trigger something from the past you know even for example if somebody was i don't know raped in a, a, um, a wood and the sun's shining down at a certain angle then there's the potential for that part, that little bit that's walking through a wood and having the sun shining at a certain angle to trigger the emotions from that time. And yet, I mean, imagine, how are they ever going to work that one out? Yeah, you know, that's And right. yet they, over, they analyze and analyze. Right. Quite often it's an automatic trigger that they'll never know. But if they can sit, feel, acknowledge the emotion and then self-soothe, then gradually they learn to deal with these triggers. Yeah, and that brings up another point is that this overanalyzation, and I see it a lot in people too. They're trying to find out what is the trigger or what's causing this, and that just creates more stress sometimes. Because like you said, it could be an unconscious thing like a sliver of light or sound that triggers yeah. something, 
Yet when we go searching and we can't figure it out, it's just creating more stress versus just saying, okay, I got triggered, let me calm down. Sometimes yeah. I might know what it is, sometimes I don't know what it is. Um, you yeah. know, I've heard so many stories of, I had one guy who 20 years after being retired, his pain was always worse on Sunday night and we couldn't figure it out. We actually did figure out why, but he would go to work on Monday morning and have to fly somewhere for his job. He worked for the IRS in, in the US and he hated the fly. He, he terribly hated the fly. Really? So 20 years later, he hadn't flown in 20 years, <laughs> but every Sunday night his pain got worse. Now, <laughs> I did figure that out, but that's kind of hard to figure out. You know, sometimes you can't figure that out. That's a memory from 20 years ago, still triggering yes. a reaction, right? So anything can trigger a reaction, can it? Absolutely, yeah. But then the more we do start um, at least feeling that emotion, rather than just carrying on regardless and not recognizing it, the more we've got a chance of settling it down. Um, and, certain, and also we can... Where sometimes we, as you say, we gain insights or people can gain insights. Um, and that's often, for example, by asking the question before meditating or asking, uh, you know, going into an emotional awareness exercise and just breathing slowly, calming yourself down and then just asking, so what is causing this pain or this whatever? Well, why do I have pain on a Sunday night? Now, sometimes, and again, not always, but sometimes while doing that and just observing the body, they'll i've certainly gained an in, insights from doing that right okay? so, or nighttime programming asking the question three times writing it down and then go to sleep because then the brain will pro the unconscious mind will process that That's overnight right. and sometimes people will dream uh, have a dream that sort of releases some emotion or helps them gain insights or they wake up in the morning and have an insight but it's what we're saying here it's about the searching for it and the analyzing it they're less likely to be able to find um, what's going on. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And so, you know, all the stuff we're talking about, George, you've done such great work. Maybe just speak a little bit because we can talk about this all day. <laughs> speak about, <laughs> yeah. right, such great stuff about That's how your work has really, has really taken off. You put, I know you put so much effort into SERPA and working people and then you got rewarded. You went and did a TED talk. Maybe speak about that a little bit, how, you know, it is changing a little bit the landscape, the fact that, you know, they reached out to you and you, they allowed you to come on and do a TED Talk. So didn't we share that and where people can find that, that TED Talk that you did? Yes, well, it was in Manchester University. So they approached me and asked me if I would um, give this talk. Um, and so, yes, that was in May this year. I have to say it was very bad timing. It was just as my father moved into a hospice. Um, but thank goodness for this work that helped me at least get through it. <laughs> Maybe not as well as I would have liked it to, but I'm not a perfectionist anymore, and it's okay. Um, but yes, so I've used, as, as we say, this is work that we use all the time ourselves. Um, but it's uh, if you look go on YouTube and just type in Georgie Oldfield um, TEDx, then uh, you'll find it on there. And what I wanted to do really was get people asking questions, so questioning what their understanding was, whether that's the public or health professionals. And so there's a lot of the evidence in there. And that's why it took so long for TED to um, publish it, because they have to check all the um, studies that we actually included. So I had to send all the references in because they wouldn't let us use slides. Um, so it's it's on YouTube now. And it really and it's obviously if we can all share it, then that is one other way that helps raise yeah. awareness of this work. Yeah, absolutely. And then how can people find more about yourself, the work you're doing, either as people want to reach out to you as a client, they're looking for help or as a healthcare practitioner, maybe looking to learn more about how I can become more um, educated in this area of treating chronic pain and other chronic health problems. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the, our main website is serpa.org, so S for sugar, I, R, P for Peter, A dot org. And you can, the, all my emails come to the same box anyway, so whether it's health professionals or the public, they can get through to me from the Serpa website. Although I do have my own website, which I'm less, go to less, um, but that's just georgieoldfield.com. Um, and really, most most of the information, whether it's for health professionals or the or public, is on that uh, SERPA website. And that also has a, um, a list of practitioners like yourself who are on there. So people, it, it, you know, there aren't that many of us, unfortunately. But at least if somebody wants face to face, they can see if somebody's near them. And if not, most of us do now these days work on Skype or some sort of online platform. Yeah, awesome. 
And uh, maybe we'll just finish up with like, just see where do you think this work's going? I mean, you started with Dr. Sarno 2007, visited him. You've been working at this now for a number of years. Where do you see this work going from his work and now moving forward? I know he's the pioneer of this work, but where do you see it going in the future? Well, I think we certainly can't forget the fact that Dr. Sarno really started this, and I'm so glad that he was alive to see um, the PPD Association moving forward um, and this work really evolving. Um, and I think it's just going to continue to evolve. Um, there are more and more doctors and health professionals um, and the public obviously becoming aware of this. And the more people that are, the better. Um, we, uh, I was involved with uh, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in the UK who gives standards about things and I went down specifically to London, I was invited actually, to join in their um, first initial meeting about what, how the new standards for persistent pain. They'll be out next year but I wanted to be absolutely sure that they were going to include adverse childhood experiences and all this, you know, looking at all the sort of work that we do as well. Um, and it seems that they were but I wasn't able to continue with uh, with them as they uh, develop these um, the standards, um, but that's that's going down through there. Um, you know, we've had conferences in the UK that's raising awareness, and gradually, I think you know, certainly in America and the UK especially, then awareness is growing, and I can really see that. Okay, maybe not in the not next ten years or so, but we're heading that way where the mind-body relationship is far more uh, understood, widely accepted and understood. And, al and although we now have moved from the, bio the biomechanical model to the biopsychosocial, and we're doing more of the psychosocial, I think it's, it's moving, it's definitely, you can see it's moving that way from the evidence that's coming out, even from the uh, Laura Mosley work in the pain science side of it. Gradually, the evidence is catching up. And unfortunately, it takes a long time for, they say, 20 years before the evidence really gets to the clinical interface, as is with the adverse childhood experiences studies, it's 20 years, um, but it's getting there. Uh, and I think with the adverse childhood experience studies, with the mindfulness as well, gradually we're getting there um, until it's going to be understood, it's going to be accepted when people go to their, their GP for them to ask them, what's going on in your life? You know, what's, yeah. and, and then, were you supported in childhood? That sort of thing. They can't not, can they, Jim? I mean, when you see all the studies now, with especially adverse childhood experiences, they cannot not ask anybody who has health problems whether they've had previous trauma. Yeah, no, I agree. And simple questions. Like, I remember seeing a patient who never once was the question asked, and she had gone through <laughs> surgery, uh, sciatic surgery, uh, piriformis uh, removal, all these different things, oh, and, and no injury, no injury at all. You had a simple question of, you know, what was happening around the time? Well, my father passed away, and then two months later, the pain started. No yeah. injury. And just a simple question like that, yeah. you know, or just like you said, a question of what, what, what is going on in your life, like happened to you, which opened your yeah. eyes to this work. A very simple question could yeah. gain a lot of information, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you, Georgie, for coming on. I think you shared so much good information and little nuggets of knowledge that people can take away. They know how to find your work. You've done amazing work. You've been an inspiration for me and my work. So thank you very much. And um, thank yeah, you, Jim. we'll keep beating this drum and trying to put the word yeah. out. All of us together and more and more of us coming, um, coming into this work. It can only help. It can only help. All right, Georgie, thank you so much for being uh, on and I appreciate your time and energy and uh, we will talk to you soon. Thanks, Jim. Okay.